I'm David Levi Strauss, Chair of the MFA Program in Art Writing here at the School of Visual Arts. Tonight we're very pleased to have our own Nancy Prinsenthal here to talk about her new book from Thames and Hudson, Unspeakable Acts, Women, Art, and Sexual Violence in the 1970s. Nancy's taught for us for many years now. Um, she was a senior editor at Art in America for even more years, and she remains a contributing editor there, yes? Yes. She's also written for the New York Times, Parquette, The Village Voice, and many other publications. Agnes Martin, Her Life and Art, came out in 2015 and won the Penn Award for Biography. She's written essays for many books on artists, including Alfredo Jarre, Shira Nishat, Chris Martin, Ursula von Riddingsward, Jane Hammond, Anne Hamilton. Now I'm just uh, listing a few of the artists that I love because it, she's written about so many. Uh, here's what Lucy Lepard said about Nancy's new book. Nancy Prinsenthal speaks of the unspeakable brilliantly, bravely, thoroughly, and thoughtfully. She addresses art, literature, theater, film, and video games and the real-life politics they reflect, offering a long overdue look at creative coverage of rape, domestic violence, and other acts. In the process, she has also written one of the, great, one of the best recent books on feminist arts. Please welcome Nancy Principal. Thank you, Levi. Where, where, oh, now I see you. Thank you for that nice introduction. It's great to be here. I, I've been away for a semester, and it feels very very warm and welcoming to be back. So, um, I, and thank you, Annette. Um, I'm going to start by reading a few pages from the very beginning of the book, and um, then because I'm in an art school, I'm actually going to do a very short slide presentation of some of the work that I cover, and then I, at the end, will read a page and a half from the very end of the book. And that's all you need to know. <laughs> that's the whole thing. So, um, what if, Suzanne Lacey asked Judy Chicago in 1970, we brought an audience into a theater, lowered the lights, and simply played audio tapes of women recounting in elaborate detail the story of their rape? Close quote. Oh, sorry, neither of us had ever heard women talking personally to each other about these things, let alone to an audience, she later wrote. You have to remember that in 1970, you could not find stories of women who were raped. To broadcast these experiences, even if only anonymously, to an audience of strangers was radical to a degree nearly incomprehensible now in an age when memoir is the default means of cultural expression and trauma its dominant narrative. Yet this is what two pioneering West Coast artists and activists encouraged a group of women to do for a shattering 1972 performance called Ablutions, breaching a cultural silence with testimony that was as straightforward as it was devastating. From there, the conversation has only gotten more complicated. If we're going, going to talk about sexual violence, we will have to come to terms with what it is. That is harder than it seems. Acts of gendered aggression range from workplace coercion and everyday harassment to vicious and even fatal physical attacks by intimates and by strangers. All have been called rape, and no form of violence is more susceptible to redefinition by shifting cultural forces. In the spectrum of dramatic injury, of harm organized for maximum emotion, emotional as well as physical impact, sexual violence occupies a uniquely potent and unstable place. Tricky to define, sexual offenses are even more difficult to depict. Popular culture, with its warp speed feedback loops, has long dominated the understanding of sexual violence, affecting perpetrators and victims alike. We've all seen the movie, the TV show, the video clip. We've read the article, the post, the tweet. This is how it's done, we learn, this is how it feels. It's no contradiction to add that the commercial media's view of sexual violence has always been distorted, favoring sensationalism over factual or emotional honesty. But artists, almost by definition, challenge popular formulations. 
They give shape to experiences we don't quite know how to picture or name. The pioneering women artists who explored sexual violence in the 1970s had a wide open arena and plenty to say. We are enormously in their debt. Slowly, mainstream culture has been learning to pay attention. This book addresses the contributions of these pioneers and also the work that influenced and succeeded theirs and proposes that we can move forward with something more than a sense of awe at their courage and ingenuity. While I was writing it, I was often told that I had hit upon an especially timely subject. In truth, there have been screaming headlines for decades about such assaults. In the military and in religious institutions, in schools and within families, indeed any place where power is unequally distributed. Yet some moments are decisive. The 70s was one. It was an era of extraordinary violence in the United States from urban crime to political protest, the latter a form of street theater that was fast turning deadly. War had long since become a theater too in more ways than one. The protracted conflict in Vietnam was the first to be televised, an exceptionally ugly conflict played out on home screens in real time. At the same time, the emergence of second wave feminism and the reconfiguration of relations between men and women wrought by what was called the sexual revolution, together with a dramatically rising incidence of rape, thoroughly reshaped attitudes about sexual assault. The early 70s also marked a turning point for art. At a time when minimalist and conceptual pre precepts, brawny processes and industrial materials prevailed and when not only personal experience but nameable content of any kind was looked at askance, progressive women artists turned things inside out with embodiment as their fundamental premise, newly emboldened women stripped themselves naked, literally and emotionally. Taking their bodies as subjects meant, meant exploring physical life in the positive, active sense, celebrating what women do, both routinely and exceptionally, and also the reverse, looking closely and honestly at the things that have been done to us eternally and without recognition, much less accountability restoring personal meaning to art and finding a language to talk about embodied experience were inseparable goals. For several reasons, confronting sexual violence was not the first challenge undertaken by women artists of the time, nor was it an early concern of second wave feminism. But once addressed, it came to exemplify the feminist art movement. Okay, so although this book is subtitled, uh, you know, Women in Art and Sexual Violence in the 70s, I actually begin in the 60s, a little prologue, um, um, in a chapter called Looking for Trouble, which is about a handful of artists who entered into the public realm either in a formal audience and, and stage situation or on the street and looked for um, expressions of danger, essentially at a time when urban life was, was going, growing more fraught um, and when violence did be, begin to loom um, much more powerfully and, and prevalently, um, some artists undertook to um, frame that in their work. The, the other thing that, that was beginning to happen in the 60s um, with artists like Yoko Ono, who's on the screen now um, in a piece called Cut Piece, which was first presented in 1964, is that a, a genre called performance art um, was being kind of brought to birth. Um, and what, for my purposes, I'm going to say is critical about performance art is that it puts performers in a position that is somewhere between um, acting a role, being an actor, actor actress, um, and um, speaking for themselves in a strictly personal autobiographical way. So there's a kind of dissociation that occurs with performance art. Performers both are and are not in the role that they're presenting or are the role that they're presenting in a way that happens to be particularly pertinent for the experience of sexual assault, which is so much connected to dissociation. So Cut Piece is um, a performance I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, Yoko Ono first performed it in um, 1964 in Kyoto, where um, she reports the audience was relatively demure, playing to stereotype here. Um, and nevertheless, some guy stood over her with a scissors 
um, you know, placed over her head in a, in a way that she found uncomfortably theatrical. I should say for anyone who doesn't know how this performance works, what it is very simply is that Ono sits on stage, she appears fully clothed in this very demure black outfit. At one point she complained that she was too poor to keep sacrificing these black dresses and cardigans and because um, she performed it more than once and the audience was invited to come to the stage one by one and snip at her clothing and that had different results in different contexts so she next performed it the following year at carnegie hall and there's a there's a recording of that performance where you can hear you know sort of murmurings and chuckles from the audience it's clear that um, there is discomfort um, it's also clear that more men than women um, were leaping to the stage to snip away at her clothing. Um, in 1966, she did a third performance in London, uh, um, the uh, DI, Destruct Destruction in Art Symposium, which was a very freewheeling um, event that brought together um, a, a range of um, performers and, and academics, theorists, um, everyone from the anti-psychiatrist R.D. Lang and his colleagues um, to uh, Fluxus performers, of, of which Ono was then one. And that was the performance at which um, she was stripped naked, which wasn't the case in the other two, and there was total pandemonium. The other thing that changed considerably over the course of those three years and then to the present, almost, um, because she continues to, um, she did continue to represent the performance and also other artists have presented it as well, is that what she says about it has shifted over any artist's prerogative, has shifted over the years. Um, so at first she talked a little mournfully about the fact that um, the audience just kept wanting to you know, get to the heart of her and you know, when they got to what she called the stone of her being, they weren't even satisfied with that and wanted to go further. Um, and then she began to talk in a, um, a more sort of Yoko Ono style about um, the point of the performance being to give, to let go of ego, to um, give to the audience what they wanted to take rather than, as is typical with artists, giving them what the artist wanted to give. Um, and it wasn't until 2015 um, that she issued a statement that was um, strictly feminist. She's, um, she said she um, begun to feel that the point of the performance was, hey, you're doing this to women. We're all in it. Which is, I think, the way we tend to read the performance um, from the perspective of 2019. Um, her second piece of advice in 2015 was, don't fight, let it happen. By not fighting, we show them that there is a whole world that could exist by being peaceful. So that, that too is very Yoko Ono. Um, the critical response ranged even more widely. Alexander Monroe in 2000 called the work a social commentary on quiet violence. Um, on the other hand, as early, that was um, 2000, as early as 1968, um, there was a writer in what was called a gentleman's magazine of the time, Tab, um, which ran a headline that said, the hippiest artistic happening, step up and strip me nude. And then Yoko, a Japanese lovely, does not take her clothing off. The audience does it for her. Guys who used to sit back and yell, take it off, now have the opportunity to do it for her. So, you know, what I'm suggesting is that the range of responses was enormously broad, that Yoko Ono was a pioneer in, um, in articulating something that was abroad, you know, the sense of vulnerability, the sense of... Uh, danger of foot and the kind of um, ease with which um, men especially felt they could disrobe um, a woman on stage. This is a, a piece um, from a few years later, 1968, Valley Export, uh, Tap and Touch Cinema. And what's going on here, as you can probably see, is that she's got um, a box around her torso, and she's working with her friend Peter Weibel. You can't see him in this picture, but he's got that mic megaphone, and he's inviting you know pedestrians to step right up and like see what's inside that box, which is pretty much what you would expect is inside that box. Um, and so men 
again, mostly men, as in this picture, had a chance to have an encounter that was sort of an inversion of the cinematic experience, you know, which is look but don't touch. This was touch but you can't see. And it proved to be just as baffling and created just as much um, silence, really. Silence was the primary response to Yoko Ono's performance. Um, as um, developed articulate response. In the same continuum is, um, and this is one of the only places that where I'm going to talk at some length about um, a work by men, because it's relevant, are a number of pieces by Vito Acconci. Um, so this is from roughly the same time, 1969. This is following piece, which again, many of you I'm sure are familiar with. Um, again, a very simple piece. Um, for a month, he committed, Vito in the front, the guy he's following in the background in the white shirt. Um, he committed to following a random passerby for as long as that passerby was in a public space. So that could be for 20 minutes before the guy went home or the woman went home. Most of the people he followed were men. It wasn't, you know, a sexually aggressive thing. Um, but sometimes, you know, he wound up going to like, you know, dinner and, uh, you know, and a double movie event. Um, so, you know, some of the commitments were hours long. Double feature, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, summoning something from the past is so hard. What is a double feature? Um, and, uh, you know, as was his want, um, Vito Acconci presented this as a conceptual project. It was about um, throwing his voice. It was about articulating a relationship of two people in an urban space. It was about being controlled, as he saw it, by the person he was following because he had to, um, he had to do whatever that person did. He didn't see it as a, a threatening operation. Um, he had been to the Iowa Writers' Workshop. He had started as a poet. He, you know, found that he had more traction in the art world, so he adjusted his framework to that. And in fact, in case you've ever wondered how these photographs, which are quite famous, of Vito following came about, he just restaged it after the fact because, you know, if there had been a photographer following him, it was... <laughs> <laughs> totally messed up the performance. But he realized as he got to know the art world a little better that you really can't make a point without a picture in the art world. It has to be in the art magazine for anyone to know what it is. Um, so uh, Vito did a number of pieces that involved um, the kind of negotiation of space, uh, controlling space, you know, sort of marking the boundaries of where one person's force or power and another person's, all in, you know, strictly gender neutral and really emotionally um, dispassionate terms, including when he um, did this piece, piece, which is called Broad Jump. This is a, a poster he presented um, to explain it in 1971. And the way this piece works, um, worked, took place in Atlantic City on the boardwalk, um, is that he made his best effort to jump as far as he could. Not a terribly athletic guy, but, you know, he did what he could. And, um, and then he challenged viewers, passers-by again, to outperform him. And this is his explanation. A jump for a broad. Each successful contestant wins from me, a woman, for two hours. Winners can choose between two women whose photographs han hang on the wall. The chosen girl is, quote, obliged to spend two hours with each winner. The contestants, Victor, and, you know, he, he puts this in terms of, again, he is the victim. He's the one who's being controlled by the terms of this um, performance that he's outlined. The contestant's victory over me has consequences. Anyone who jumps further than he does gets to take one of his two girlfriends away from him for a couple hours. Um, the, I am defeated in my role of sportsman, sporting man. 
the prize is prized away from me. He, you know, loved puns. Um, as he's in, he's in love with both women. Um, and, you know, in, in later, in a later explanation, he talked about it as, again, exercising control over the space. So, you know, I'm, I'm presenting this not, you know, as character assassination of Vito Acconci, who um, sadly didn't live long enough for me to ask him what the heck he meant, uh, you know, now in, in, in 2018 or 17 when I could have done it. Um, but I think it speaks so clearly for the time that he was operating in, you know, that if you called yourself a conceptualist, if you used conceptualist language, and if you were a man, you could do work like this and have it be approached in those terms, you know, even by women, um, art historians and art critics. So, um, it's against this background that women began to speak up and say, you know, this is not the way conceptual works for us. This is not the way expression works for us. And um, I should say it's not just the art world that made speaking up difficult. Um, a lot of the passion in second wave feminism came from women who had been involved in anti-war and civil rights movements and were treated so abominably um, in those movements um, by the men who were leading them that um, against the inclination to put solidarity around issues like ending the war in Vietnam or ending um, racial injustice aside and speak up for rights of our own. Um, but it, it was complicated. And um, so when Susan Brown Miller wrote um, Against Our Will, Men, Women, and Rape in 1975, um, one of the first things she said was, rape was not the first thing on our agenda. Our agenda was about solidarity, it was about issues that unite women, it was about being tough, standing up for um, equal pay, for domestic equity in terms of, you know, housekeeping and child rearing, for um, safety in the home, for things that every woman um, shares, and, or so it was said. And also among our critics and historians, like the you know unimpeachable Linda Nochlin, um, who wrote that monumental essay in 1971, "Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists," um, w was very keen to let people, let women know what the right way to approach um, taking control of the reins was. And of course, the thrust of her argument was. Of course, there have been great women artists. It's you know, it's institutional um, imbalances of power that make it difficult for women to have the opportunities that they need. Um, but she also said, um, "Great art, and this is a quote, is not about personal experience, personal expression of individual emotional experience. It is neither a sob story nor a confidential whisper." So, you know, there was a certain amount of agreement that for women to claim what was theirs as artists, it was important to suppress, um, you know, grievance culture. It was important to suppress the impetus to speak up for experiences that were difficult and that were very personal. Um, and that was hard to overcome. So when this performance ablutions took place in 1972, to which I referred in the very beginning of the first chapter in the book, it was indeed something of a shock. I mean, it was a very kind of over-the-top performance. There are a zillion things going on at once. You can see just the, the sort of overwhelmingness of it, the frenzy of the, there were three tubs, uh, three metal tubs in which naked women sat and one was filled with blood and one was filled with raw eggs and one was filled with clay and the women got into those tubs 
consecutively and then were taken were lifted out and dried off and bound and there were there was more at stake than sexual violence alone one of the it was this performance came out of a workshop with Judy Chicago that um, that Suzanne Lacey who was instrumental in, in conceiving this performance wasn't a part of, but they worked together. And then, of course, it involved a great number of other women, including Aviva Romana, Romani and, and Sandra or Orgel and um, other performers, some of whom you see. Um, someone, I think it's Suzanne Lacey, is nailing beef kidneys to the wall. By the end, I, you know, there's blood dripping, the women are all bound. Um, but the key thing about this performance is that throughout there were um, there was played audio tapes of women's testimony about their subjection to to sexual assault to rape, and that is what left people absolutely stone silent. So it was a performance that was presented once in an artist studio in Venice, California, and yet the reports are there's no press that I know of. The reports were nobody knew what to say. This is not that different now. Nobody really knew what to say. And indeed, it was a kind of overwhelming performance. What can you say? Um, the same seems to have been true for um, the work that Anna Mangieta did when she was still a student at the University of Iowa. Um, this work is also pretty well known. I don't have slides for it. Um, it's pretty raw. And she was at the University of Iowa when a young woman, a nursing student, was killed. It was believed that the woman had been sexually violated. That turned out uh, not to be the case, but it was very upsetting for the community. There hadn't been a, a brutal murder like that in a long time, especially not of a young woman. And so there was a lot of press about it. And Anna Mangieta staged a number of tableau in which she essentially presented herself as the victim, naked from the waist down, leaning over her kitchen table, blood all over the place. I mean, you know, these initial performances, which were mostly done very early in the women's careers um, in question, um, were really, really raw. And um, there's, a, a, there's a woman, Julia Hertzberg, who's done a dissertation about um, Mangieta, and she interviewed a, a number of um, Mangieta's fellow students to see what the response was at the time. And mostly what they said was, well, you know, nobody really said anything. Nobody said anything. Which, you know, it's a different time. And the protocol at Critz in, in 1973 was different from the protocol of Critz now, when I think students are more likely to speak up and are um, encouraged to speak up and do. Um, but these, uh, this performance, this sort of moment of delivering testimony was really anomal anomalous. There wasn't, um, there wasn't a sense of how to make this into an articulable um, expression. And what began to happen very quickly is that the women involved shifted from straight ahead testi testifying, you know, these shocking stories that really, it seems, nobody had been talking about. I mean, Suzanne Lacey says these women, you know, hadn't told their partners, they hadn't told their family, they hadn't told their psychiatrist, they hadn't told anyone. Um, it was just not something that was talked about, and it was very difficult to get people to speak. Um, so Suzanne Lacey and others um, shifted into the mode of activism, which um, again, more or less in invented a, a genre, invented, you know, art as activism, social justice art, um, around this issue, around the issue of sexual violence. Um, what's on the screen now is a book called Rape Is. It's a little square white book, which has, as you can see, a red seal on the cover. So in order to read the book, you have to break the seal. Um, and it was modeled on um, Charlie Brown's Peanuts books, Happiness Is. So, you know, happiness is, you know, having a chocolate chip cookie with your best friend. Rape is 
when a policeman asks you as he fills out a rape report, do you undress in front of your windows? Um, so there's a series, and it's a, very, it's a very carefully sequenced series of statements like this. It's the same all the way through the book. And it begins in childhood, it ends in adulthood. It begins with, you know, rape is when you're sitting on your grandpa's lap and he slips a hand into your panties. And it ends with, you know, when you're happy to escape with your life. But in between, there are a number of things that um, are in that range of it's really about coercion or it's really about harassment, including rape is, you know, when you're driving your car and minding your own business and somebody calls out to you, hi, sweetie. So there arises this question of what rape is. And um, I should also say, because I did decide to write this book and, and there's a question of why, um, why would anyone choose this subject? That this is a book that I came across very early in my career. I was working at Printed Matter in 19, fall 1978. Um, this book was published in a very teeny edition in 72 and then reissued in 76. And it was at Printed Matter. And you know, when I was in college, which at that point was just two years prior, there was a lot of stuff going on on college campuses. It was, it was, it was a very dicey time. And a lot of us found ourselves in urban universities that were um, little islands of privilege in the middle of desperately poor and angry communities. And stuff happened that wasn't talked about, certainly wasn't talked about college administrators, nor really was it talked about um, by feminists. It just didn't have a place to go. And um, I also discovered when I was at Printed Matter a volume of the magazine Heresies put out by um, a collective, a wonderful series of publications by a wonderful collective of feminist artists. And, and this, this particular issue on violence was also kind of wildly chaotic all over the place, but very short on testimony and also very short on sympathy. Um, if you go back to the first editions of Our Bodies Ourselves, you find first nothing on violence against women. And next, okay, let's learn how to fight back. You know, we can do this, sisters. Let's get tough. So, you know, and let's also not forget to be sensitive to the accused. I mean, where a lot of the trouble arose in second wave feminism in speaking up against rape was, so who do you bring this complaint to the police. I mean, there was no one, you know, in the left at that time, or even now, um, who is eager to redress the issue within the criminal justice system. Why would you? So um, it was a very complicated time. By 1977, Suzanne Lacey was organizing um, events like th Three Weeks in May um, in Los Angeles. This was a series of um, lunchtime and evening performances. She worked with the police department. She worked with social service agencies. She worked with the media. She worked with feminist activists. She worked with artists. And it was a model that she developed that is still, I think, critical today in making change happen. Um, and it was, it was radical and it was wildly successful. Um, perhaps most of all in terms of bringing the media on board, understanding that bringing the media on board was the most important thing to making change happen. One of the things that she did, this is what's on the screen, is she made a map of Los Angeles and um, over the course of the three weeks she um, made a stamp um, and stamped the word rape wherever a rape occurred during that time. There were 85 rapes during that time in Los Angeles, which was at the time called the rape capital of the world or of the country. Um, another th thing I've looked at in this book, um, and this is sort of a retreat and um, a kind of deeper dive into work that addresses sexual violence is role-playing, um, identity crises. Um, no one 
went further down this road than Lynn Hirschman Leeson when she took on the alter ego, ego Roberta Brightmore. She was working from a short story by Joyce Carol Oates, fascinating story, where more or less the plot of Roberta Brightmore was laid out. So um, Lynn Hirschman developed a makeup regimen, a wardrobe um, for this alter ego. She, um, Roberta, had her own career. She had her own driver's license. She had her own dentist. She had her own checking account. She had her own social worker. She went to S meetings. She had her own life. Um, and she also, going back to the kind of work that, um, that Valley Export was doing, she's, she put herself in the line of danger. Um, so she ran ads in a local magazine newspaper in, in San Francisco um, saying that she was looking for a companion, deliberately ambi ambiguous about what that meant. And of course, most of the respondents were men. And she did very nearly get in trouble. She describes a number of situations that became dangerous. She doesn't give details about what happened. She also talks quite a bit about her own experience of sexual violation at the hands of her father as a child. Um, and she does that as Roberta and also as herself um, in a way that she allows us to um, question what the veracity of that um, account is. And on the one hand, distrusting your own experience is associated with, especially with very horrific experiences of sexual violation. Um, but it also allows viewers to um, consider in some depth what, in, what encourages trust. You know, what's the evidence that we believe? And why don't we when we don't? Here she is in costume. She ultimately um, invited a couple of other women to take on the role of Roberta because it was just too too um, draining emotionally. And then she had a sort of exorcism um, when Roberta was finally laid to rest. Um, wildly different and yet not completely unrelated is an alter ego that Adrian Piper adopted um, at the same time. 19, it began roughly in 1973. The mythic being has a very complicated timeline. Um, but Adrian Piper ran these very small ads again, and this is like from the era when everything that happened happened in the classified ad section of various you know newspapers. It's you know it's like when Suzanne Lacey was organizing three weeks in May, it all happened in the yellow pages, or it all happened in you know the white pages. It was you know it was an age of print. So Adrian Piper ran these very small ads in the classified section of the Voice um, that developed this persona, the mythic being. Um, this was happening while she was pursuing a doctorate in philosophy at Harvard. Um, so the mythic being, and she did of course become a professional philosopher and was the first tenured woman African American philosopher in the country at Wellesley. Um, who said that? Thank you, Nina. Um, there's part of her history she doesn't talk about anymore, so I have to careful what I say. Could be Wellesley. Um, anyway, so, you know, what she did was she placed herself in the, in the role of this swaggering black guy. Um, I embody everything you most hate and fear. Um, only saying, you know, something that in some sense, none of us can deny, her, her included. So, you know, intraracially as well as interracially, there was stuff going on that just couldn't be said. She staged a mugging, you know, it was a setup with a white guy in um, Harvard Yard. She cruised white women as the mythic being. And, you know, she went fearlessly far in looking into what these roles, um, where they came from, you know, who invented them, and for what purpose, and um, as Piper is very clear, 
on the fact that race is a cultural construction. Um, who is responsible for them? Okay, I'm now racing to the end. Um, and um, just going to very quickly run through some slides of um, work since uh, the 70s to suggest that things have gotten more particular, more nuanced, more, um, more responsible to the specifics of a historical, social, and cultural context um, than they were in the 70s when it was just this outpouring of fairly undigested emotion, um, harrowing though it was. This is um, Kara Walker's first famous cutout piece when she was fresh out of school, Gone, a historical romance with, you know, her famously polymorphous libidinousness, quite savage. Um, this is from a project that Jenny Holzer did in the early 1990s in response to the epidemic of rape as a as an instrument of war in the Bosnian conflict. So she ran these, um, this little pamphlet in the Süddeutsche Zeitung, um, a German newspaper, Sunday newspaper, with a series of, of statements like this. It was a very complicated installation with multiple parts that looked at um, rape from the perspective of the perpetrator, the victim, and a bystander, all speaking in different voices. And I believe this is my last slide. Um, Joyce Scott from a series called The Day After Rape. Um, this is, uh, Joyce Scott has addressed herself, it's a teeny piece, so these are tiny little beads, has addressed herself to um, sexual violence in conflicts in Africa largely. So I will just read the last page. Um, Those statistics on sexual assault are notoriously unreliable. It has been reported that the number of rapes per capita in the United States has declined by more than 85 percent since the 1970s. Despite a consensus among the women I talk to um, in this book, so it's mostly the women whose work you've seen, um, and others, um, that not enough has changed in 2019. Um, we do have cause for celebration. Some forms of rape have long been declining over the past several decades. A wealth of artists, and not only female ones, have addressed sexual violence with increasing freedom and received sympathetic consideration. More flexible and tolerant attitudes toward sexual identity have opened and enriched discussions of gender relations generally. That doesn't mean sexual violence is no longer a problem, but it does suggest that moving forward, we need to remain alert to the specifics of violation. Vulnerability is not equally distributed. Those who are poor or are, who, or are not white are at greater risk. Not all harms are equivalent. Danger must be faced honestly and openly by artists, by viewers, by everyone. Opposing the unfortunate tendency to circle the wagons, Johanna Feitman, writing an art form, calls for difficult work, for art that is painful, challenging, triggering. To want to be triggered by art, she writes, is perhaps as simple as wanting objects and images that cut through, that synthesize the evidence in jolting ways, or that distill our era's dreadful background hum into compelling new symbols. It is an invitation to make just the kind of work pioneered by artists in the 70s and extended in its wake an art that is unyielding in its truth to unspeakable experience. So I will thank you. End the silence. <laughs> I ask a question. I mean, yeah, I did. I mean, there were some things that were just, I mean, apart from like taking a closer look at Vito Okonji, who I can't not like, you know, it's impossible to 
fundamentally not like Vito Acconci, but it, it, you know, that work was shocking. And you know, I, I devoted way too much space to a guy named Menachem Amir, um, who did research in, really in the 50s and 60s, that was published in the 70s, um, in a book called um, Patterns of Forcible Rape, which right away you think, forcible rape? Is there another kind? <laughs> and uh, you know, it's just, you know, he, he develops this theme called victim precipitated rape, which he says, you know, can be found in, oh, a majority of cases, and in children as young as like five. And the only reason I bring this up is that it was taken quite seriously. Brown Miller quoted him, and Susan Griffin quoted him, and Diane Russell quote, you know, all these feminists quoted him without condemning him because, because the context made it seem that the fact that he was talking about gang rape, which no one had, or you know, talking about um, how common rape was, which no one had, made him seem maybe kind of, a, I mean, what he said about, about people who weren't wealthy and people of color, I, I can't even repeat, it's just shocking. Um, so yeah, I, it made me angry. But you know, sometimes anger is motivating. Sometimes it's debilitating. I think I probably made it clear that I find some of the art, the key pieces, um, really unresolved. Um, but I also think they're key, and they really changed things. So, you know, I, I've been thinking about this subject for a long time. You know, it's the kind of subject, it is a subject, that wouldn't have gotten a green light until recently. Um, I've proposed it before, um, and I just kind of followed the dots, I, you know. It didn't seem like there was a wealth of stuff from the period that I was excluding. Of, of course, now there is, you know, now there's mountains of, of relevant material, and I wish I could have shown more, but the book is really about the 70s. Kathy Dillon was his partner throughout that period, and um, and then there was another woman who was involved with them at the. I mean, he made that a, a you know a pretext of broad jump, um, and she disappeared. She won't talk to anyone, as far as I can tell. Um, and there was a point um, much later when Vito said. I'm sorry I didn't give the women more credit for their creative role. He, he did that. Yeah, I don't need to go further because you're rolling your eyes, but you know. So, you know, and then he talked about his parents' relationship and, and I like his work. without exception, the women that I asked this question of have, you know, have things gotten better and they, you know, the first response is absolutely not. And then, well, maybe, but not enough. And yeah, I mean, Trump. One way to start, I don't know whether this is the distinction you have in mind, is that uh, you know, a witness doesn't have to be the person to whom the experience happened. Uh, you know, a witness can just be the person who speaks out. Um, even assuming that those two roles are identical, um, I think it's a choice of you know, taking a speaking stance you know, rather than... Um, But which would be the witnessing? Um, in any case, I mean, those are those are the two strokes, right? You know, it, having the experience and articulating it, and then formulating it as a form of creative expression. And um, you know, in a performance like *Ablutions*, where there was this continuous tape of people just speaking of what had happened to them, they weren't seen. And um, in many cases, the, the, the voices that were being heard were people who were reading a written testimony. So there was a, you know, there was a degree of, almost throughout, there was a degree of distancing. And you know, many of the principals involved, including Suzanne Lacey, and as far as I know, Judy Chicago, said, no, this, you know, I just wanted to be clear that this is not something that's happened to me, which is interesting, I guess. Of course. I mean, it goes to the, it goes to the difficulty of defining 
you know, what we're talking about when we talk about rape. Surprisingly, I didn't. I mean, I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't able to talk to that many artists, and the ones to whom I did talk, um, you know, basically said no, although I had a, an interesting conversation with a woman who um, organized a show in 1985 at um, the University of Ohio at Kent State um, called Rape, and um, it was, it opened, you know, within a month, I think, of Mendieta's death under dubious circumstances, and um, and so this organizer, she wasn't really a curator, she was just pulled into the job, you know, got very involved and, you know, sort of changed her life. She got very involved in putting the show together, and there was a performance beforehand by Jerry Allen, who did talk about her own um, sexual um, history of sexual violence to me personally, and also in this performance, and she's continued to work on that subject, and especially with, with sex trafficking. Um, so anyway, the curator, Stephanie Blackwood, said, you know, it wasn't until now that she thought, oh, well, of course. You know, why that was so galvanizing for me is because I had been abused. Uh, you know, she gave me permission to say this in the book, which is why I'm saying it now. Um, so that's a long time, you know, 1985 to 2018. Um, and it was in there, but she hadn't put it into those words. I think that's not so uncommon. You know, I think the public pronouncement of these crimes, um, even if it was to a small audience in the case of ablutions or, you know, the activist work that, that Suzanne did in, you know, just a few years later, in relationship to the epidemic of, of crime in, in Los Angeles were, um, you know, sort of watershed events and they were um, transformative both of the possible languages of art making and also of um, ways to talk about sexual assault. So it was a fascinating nexus. Um, not all of what it spawned is you know, equally meritorious, you know. But I do think that just the development of the genre of performance, of the way bodies were used, and of course not just, you know, to help think through violence, but also in celebratory work, you know. I mean, Carol Schneeman's work was happening at the same time, and. Hannah Wilkie's, which is sort of all over the map in terms of celebration and, and mourning. Um, but the, it kind of had to be art, you know, because the other options were journalism, which, you know, was so easily sensationalized and not, um, not attended to and didn't speak to, you know, what it felt like. So I do think there was some real courage there. You're absolutely right. It's hard to reconstruct all of this stuff. And, the, you know, of course, the documentation isn't what it would be now. And memories are fallible. Um, but looking at the current work, you know, which in some ways is its legacy, is very heartening, you know, because it's it's so articulate and it's so varied and it's um, so incisive in you know ways that the early work couldn't be. So I feel. Do you feel no, differently? Okay. Thank you.